Alright, Surah Al-Ghashiyah. This Surah, Surah Al-Ghashiyah, it speaks about two main issues. Number one is the resurrection. Resurrection of humanity. And number two, establishing the clear proofs and arguments that there is only one God. The proof that there is only one God. Surah Al-Ghashiyah. And the Surah also, it ends by, as we spoke about those Dawah techniques and the etiquette, the Surah is also going to be speaking about the mission of the Prophet wasallam, and that is to pass on the message and not to force the people and compulse them into Islam. The Prophet wasallam used to recite this Surah very much in Salah. We see from his example was in uh, Salat al-Jum'ah he would recite Surah al-A'la and Surah al-Ghashiyah. And this became his custom that he would do this very often Surah Al-A'la and Surah Al-Ghashiyah he would also recite it in Surah uh, in Salat Al-Eid where a lot of people would gather and he would recite Surah Al-Ghashiyah which shows uh, the immense importance and the narrator mentions that sometimes when Eid would be on a Friday and they would pray Salat Al-Eid and then Salat Al-Jum'ah later on that at both times the Prophet وسلم, would recite Surah Al-A'la and Surah Al-Ghashiyah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع أجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سوم مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says هل أتاك حديث الغاشية If you notice from the the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how the companions would deal with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would ask them questions and then they would say like he would say atadruna ma kada like he'll say do you know what this is or do you know what this is and what would their reply be in most cases Allahu rasuluhu a'lam correct they didn't say oh yeah I know that part it's about the, the thing like that and he would say no no it's this you'll see from their etiquette and they would actually have answers in their mind you'll see in some of the narrations in the bracket the companion would say that I wish to say this but I, I didn't come forward with it. And they would say, Allah wa Rasulu a'lam. And it's almost like here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Hal ataka hadith al Almost as if the person humbles themselves in listening to the answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to pay attention. al Ghashiyah is one of the names of the day of resurrection, the day of judgment. al Ghashiyah meaning... Uh, the overwhelming calamity that will befall, befall the people. And it will overwhelm them because of the horror of that day and they won't be able to realize or to comprehend and to feel this day of Al-Ghashiyah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hajj, verse 2, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a little glimpse of that overwhelming day where He says subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا On the day where you see it, تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَةٍ That every uh, feeding woman will be distracted and will leave aside what she's feeding وَتَضَعُ كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلًا And anybody that's carrying something, whether a woman pregnant or people that have children or something, كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلًا They'll leave it aside. وَتَرَ النَّاسَ سُكَارًا And you'll see people as if they're drunk or intoxicated وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارًا And they're not intoxicated وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٌ But indeed the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe. And this is Al-Ghashiyah, the overwhelming day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وُجُوهُ يَوْمَئِذٍ خَاشِعًا That faces on that day. And Khashia, like you'll see, someone will say, for example, that someone should have khushu'ah in salah. Right? They should have... Um, khushu'ah is basically a person to humble himself and surrender his attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here on this day, that same khushu'ah that they didn't have in the dunya, they will have here in the hereafter. Humiliated, their faces down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجُوهُ يَوْمَيْذٍ خَاشِعًا Because they've come with heavy loads. خَاشِعَةٌ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 3 says, عَامِلَةٌ نَاصِبًا عَامِلَةٌ Like working hard, as it says there, working hard in the dunya, because they were laboring not for the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but now the real toil and the real hardship, the nasib, the tiredness comes in the hereafter. خَاشِعَةٌ عَامِلَةٌ نَاصِبًا It's nasiba on the Day of Judgment. In the hereafter, like subhanAllah, one of the punishments that comes upon the people is that they will not be allowed to rest. Right? The tiredness will show on their face. And I was thinking about this tiredness and I reflect on my experiences so that I can better, inshaAllah, help you to understand it. In Hajj time, you'll see people that may not have slept for two days. And you'll see it in their face. You'll know that this is a person who hasn't slept for two days. And you can see the nasab, the tiredness on their face. And now, people like that in Hajj, they're just dying to get back to their hotel room so that they can get some rest. On this day, it's not like on the Day of Judgment that the person will be able to, or right, here's the punishment, okay, now go to your hotel rooms and come back tomorrow for some more punishment. Or here's, you know, here's the lunch break and here we're back for some more punishment. They will not be allowed to rest, which is a punishment in itself. There will not be any snack breaks for them. The hunger, and you're going to see it coming up in this verse. They will cry out for hunger, and that hunger will also be a punishment for them. Their, their body will be ripping in thirst, which will also be a punishment for them. On top of the punishments that are already, that we've seen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tasla naran hamia. Tasla, enter, naran, fire, hamia, blazing, tusqa. And this is the suqya, which is the drink, uh, the drink. Tusqa min aynin aniya. Ayn is a, like a river, or a spring. Aynin aniya, and it's a boiling. Aniya, as it is an intense, boiling, scalding water. If you know, um, in the past there was a woman who sued McDonald's because of the coffee. Anybody ever hear that story? The coffee spilt on her, um, on her leg and she sued them and, and there was a lot of money in that court case. And there was a lot of people uh, in the media and the newspapers making fun of her. And I thought that it is in fact a very serious thing that they're joking, oh the water, uh, it spilled and it's no big deal. But that water was so intense it had scarred her leg and you know, had burnt and the, the degree of burns that had gone down. And that is just a little glimpse of, in this life, the kind of ania, burning, scalding water. No one would ever think to drink straight water like that. But this is not of hellfire. Not ayn and ania. That when their thirst is so intense, that they will drink this water that in itself will bring upon their destruction. And like we said, that by itself this water could kill them. But they're not dead. And the punishment keeps coming. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ فَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيَةٌ That there's no food for them. There's no food for them except from ضَرِيَةٌ ضَرِيَةٌ 
is, um, and it was actually known to the Arabs, a kind of thorny plant which is poisonous. So not only is it thorny, and I don't, th- I don't know if you've seen like plants that are thorny, the ones with the big long thorns, and in the desert you'll see it when you have, like in the cartoons they have those cactuses, I don't know if you've seen them in real life, it's not a cactus, but it's a type of thing that when it's soft, the camels would eat it, but if it uh, got ripe and the, and the thorns went um, like full and, and became strong, the camels would stay away from it, if anybody ate from it, it's actually poisonous, it could kill the person. That uh, plant, which was a dhariya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, in hellfire, they have no food except this thorny plant, which the thorns could kill them, it, they can't even swallow it, and at the same time, it's poisonous, and the poison could also kill them, from two ways, or dhariya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ فَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ dhariya, لَا يُسْمِنُ وَلَا يُغْنِ مِنْ جُوَى لَا يُسْمِنُ, it doesn't nourish them, وَلَا يُغْنِي مِنْ جُوَى And it will not satisfy their hunger. When we were growing up in North America, and, and some of you might have this um, like thought in your mind, people think that, oh, if they're in hellfire for, for eternity, perhaps the time will come upon them where they'll just get used to the punishment. Right? That it'll just be so consistent upon them that they'll eventually just say, oh, it's just hellfire. And they'll get used to it. But that's not true because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in verses such as this, and in other verses, that they'll never, it'll never satisfy their hunger. لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع. It will not nourish them, it will not satisfy their hunger. No matter how much, even if it was for an eternity, it would never satisfy their hunger. Abu Darda رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said that the pain of their hunger will be equivalent, it will increase until it equals the pain of the punishment of the fire. And when they ask for food, and they'll call out for food, they will get bariya. This is what they will be fed. And when they try to swallow it, and it won't be able to swallow, this is in verses of the Quran, they'll ask for water, and so they'll be given ayn and aniya. They'll be given water from ayn and aniya, which is that bolding, scalding water, which will destroy them the water itself in addition to the bariya, the death coming to them from all directions, wama huwa bimayyit, and they're not dying. <clears throat> if you'll notice, even in, um, when someone really wants to punish someone, they wouldn't do a swift death. For example, they'll maybe um, crucify in the past, they'll put someone up on a cross so that the death comes slowly so they can make an example out of someone. But eventually, when a person is that, in such a case, the biggest mercy for them is for them to die. Like, just get it over with. And they'll say like, you know, if you're lucky, then they'll kill you swiftly. Because of the punishment that's coming. These people will never die. And it's something that person doesn't understand. It's, for, it's an everlasting punishment. It's an everlasting punishment. Does a person really have a choice to choose the way of the wretched? When they really understand the punishment of hellfire, there is no choice. The person follows what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, and he is Rabbul Alameen. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do this, then we accept it, and we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like we saw the seriousness of where they're going to be, Allah azza wa jal gives us the opposite picture. Right here. It's almost, when a person recites that um, verse, وَجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاعِمَةً It's almost like a breath of relief. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shadeed al-iqab, is severe in punishment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor al-rahim. He's all forgiving and merciful. But it's the human that chooses which side to turn to. Whether it's to the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whether it's to the mercy and love and forgiveness of Allah azza wa jal. The person takes that path. وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاعِمَةٌ وُجُوهٌ are the faces يَوْمَئِذٍ on that day نَاعِمَةٌ نَاعِمَةٌ is joyful نَاعِم also has the meaning of soft something being soft and this is almost like the bliss and the happiness that they're in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاعِمَةٌ لِسَعِيهَا رَاضِيَةٌ سعي سعي is a person traveling down a path لِسَعِيهَا 
Allah Azza wa saying that faith is happy that they took this path in life. Isa'iha radiya. When you say radiyallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with them. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Isa'iha radiya. That is eased. And happy that, alhamdulillah, that I took this path in life. And indeed the person will only understand the happiness and of taking this path in the hereafter. When they see the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everybody falling into ruin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from this path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi jannatin aliyah. In a lofty paradise. Now I was thinking about uh, this verse, in a lofty paradise, Fi jannatin aliyah. If you ever seen in a, an apartment complex, they charge a certain price from this floor up to that floor, and then from the fifth floor up, it's another price, and from the tenth floor above, the prices increase. Why does the price increase? You know, if you ask them, why are you charging me more because I'm on the 8th floor? It's almost as if the human nature wants to be in a lofty place. Like if there's a high rise that's... I don't know if you've ever been on like a 35th floor or something like that. You can overlook the entire city, you have a beautiful view. And you're paying enormous money to get a place like that on the top floor in a lofty place. And it's almost as if human... Like in the same building, the person could be on the bottom floor. It's a bed, that's where he's sleeping. But he gets that extra, you know, that, that bliss of being high in a lofty place of rest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi jannatin aliyah. In a high and lofty paradise. And this is Jannah. Those are my own reflections. Don't say that the ulama have just here mentioned the 35th floor of an apartment complex. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La tasma'u fiha la ghiyah. That in that la tasma'u, you will not hear in that paradise fiha. Laghiyah. Laghu al kalam is false speech. Harmful speech nor falsehood. Meaning that if a person, for example, if, if they went for a vacation and on that vacation they had someone that was just complaining the whole time, and you'll see people like that on the vacation. Right? They're sitting at a table and they're in a big fight. Even though there's a pool there and everything's beautiful in their surrounding, but there's someone with them, a companion, that's talking in such a way that ruins the vacation or ruins the moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is no one like that in paradise that will ruin the atmosphere and the ambience of Jannah. لا تسمع فيها لا خير. The ulama mentioned like the gathering of scholars. And this is also an example for us. The ulama, they wouldn't talk falsehood and they wouldn't talk, talk harmful speech in their gatherings. And there were gatherings where no one would be backbited against or no one, no harm would be, would happen to someone in those gatherings. And it was the gatherings of others that these things would happen. An example, and this is in Ibn Kathir's Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah, that the scholar, um, Iyas ibn Mu'awiyah al-Muzani, who was the grand Qadi of al-Basra, he had people sitting with him. So there was one of his students, Sufyan ibn Hussein al-Wasiti. He started, he, someone came by, you know, sat with him and left. And then he started talking about that person. Started speaking ill of him. And so, yes, Ibn Mu'awiyah, his face changed color, the disgust came upon his face, and he told him, Hal ghazawta rum He said, Did you, were you part of like the Muslim army that conquered and fought the Romans? And he said, No. And then he said, Hal ghazawta turk, Hal ghazawta sind. He started mentioning different uh, battles that the Muslims had been with with the Turk and the Sin and others. And then he said, no, no. And then he said, Ha'ulai Jami'ah. He said, all these people were saved from your tongue, or saved from you, but your own Muslim brother is the one that got the axe. Meaning that you did no harm to any of the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but only your Muslim brother is the one that you decided to attack and harm. And so that student Sufyan, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, after that, I never backbiting on people as much as I knew that they would try. And you see people like Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala when he would um, he said maghtabtu ahadan he said as much as he knew that he did not backbite on any on anyone mundu an alim anna al-ghiba haram. He said after the day I found out that ghiba was haram I never backbited on anybody. And when did he learn that? Not like us when we're like in college and stuff, we learn things like this. They learn it when they're like three years old. Or even before that. They would learn very young. 
that those kind of things were haram. And he said since he was a young child, he would never uh, backbite on someone. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 10, Allah Azza just says, فِي جَنَّةٍ عَالِيَةٍ لَا تَسْمَعُ فِيهَا لَاغِيَةٍ And then verse 12, فِيهَا عَيْنٌ جَارِيَةٍ In it are an ayn, that ayn there means a spring or rivers, ayn jariya, running springs. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِيهَا سُرُرٌ مَرْفُوعًا And actually this is the verse that I was talking about, that in it are thrones or surur, like a sarir, is like a bed. And the beds are, are high. Marfu'a. Marfu'a means raised. Wa akwab mawdu'a. And cups. Akwab is the cups set at hand. Wa namarik wa masfufa. Namarik are the cushions. Masfufa are set in rows. Wa zarabiyu. Zarabiyu are the carpets. Mabthutha spread out. These are just little glimpses of paradise and the bliss in paradise. And these words, they're only words, and the reality of it is something that no human eye has ever seen, no ears have ever heard, and no heart has ever uh, comprehended and, and felt. Sometimes there are places where a person will say, it's so beautiful, you just have to go there. You ever heard people say that to you? It's so beautiful, you just have to be there, you just have to go. And when you know, a person doesn't understand, when they actually do go, and they see how beautiful the place is, yeah, you were right. I can't explain it, but it's, it's so beautiful. That no matter how beautiful somebody uh, or something is, or something that a person's experienced, Jannah is much more than that. And no heart has ever experienced that type of joy and bliss. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ That no nafs, no soul knows what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden from them min qurrati ayun from the coolness and the pleasure of their eyes jaza'an bima kanu ya'malun a repayment and a reward for those actions that they did then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about the hellfire and then speaking about jannah then Allah azza wa jal draws their attention their scientific mind to look around and be logical that this can only be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah azza wa jal says أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ Won't they look at the ibil, the camels? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ It's actually very beautiful the way the ayah comes. Don't they look at the camels? How they were created. And they actually uh, kept that structure of the sentence in English. وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ And to the heavens كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ how it was raised. Tal Jibal and to the mountains, Kayf and Nusibat. How it was rooted and fixed firm. Nusibat, and we'll talk about that. Wa ila al ardi and to the earth, Kayf and Sutihat. How it was spread forth. And so, like we said about you know the six million airplanes or six billion airplanes flying into the World Trade Center, we also say like six billion camels flying into the Trade Center also. Because if a person says it happens by coincidence, then perhaps, maybe, after a trillion years, one camel will come. One camel. After the trillions and trillions of years that they're talking about, one camel, but when you have millions upon millions of camel, then you just say to them, where did your mind go that you would think such falsehood? And these camels, I won't go into the detail of you know, this Discovery Channel, I'm sure you can find a lot of stuff on the camels. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the camel so that it's an enormous creature but you can have a child, a little child, very young, and he'll take the camel and walk with it, anywhere it wants to go. And the camel will go. Not only that, but you can have 100 camels, and one child leading all 100 of them. And the Arabs knew this very well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, سخر, He made the camels for the human beings. And if that camel just wanted to step down and crush any human being, it could. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made those camels uh, subservient to the human beings. Actually, at the um, at the Lahore Zoo, not Lahore, in actually in Bahawalnagar, right? Bahawalnagar, Bahawalpur. Those from Pakistan, they know these towns. And and the zoos. Remember, I told you they're such amazing zoos that you can pull the the lion's tail and so on. In this zoo, I actually it's a psychological game where you ask someone what's your favorite animal, and usually it reflects something from their from their character. And so I I told my wife, I go, what's your favorite animal? 
And then she said, and she turned around. She said, "That one over there." And then I looked, and I saw uh, a she camel sitting there on the side. It wasn't actually even in the cage. It was just sitting there on the, on the walkway in the in the thing. And indeed, they're uh, blessed animals and mu'adham shara'an, like we said, that they're granted uh, lofty and noble status in the Sharia. And actually, she has another um, favorite animal, and that is the uh, the crow. The crow. And the reason why the crow, because every time we see the crow, they go, oh look, it's, it's dressed like a Muslim lady. Right? The, the crow, with its jilbab and stuff like that. She's like going and going forward. So that's why we, even though the crows don't have noble status in Shania. وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَاتِ And the heaven, how they were raised. And of course we've been talking all about those heavens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling the person to look in their creation and look to those celestial objects. وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ نُصِبَتْ And the mountains, how they were um, nusib is like to be pegged down and rooted firm into the ground. And this is actually when in those books that talk about the Qur'an and sciences, there's a lot of talk about the mountains and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as pegs, as otad, and actually inshallah we're going to get to it in Surah Al-Naba, so I'll leave it till then. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَيْفَ سُطِحَتْ And the earth, how it spread forth. So when a person is traveling, if you've ever gone across, uh, across the country, we don't even think twice that the, that the earth is spread forth. That it's not moving. It's not like the water. Someone goes out in the water, they have to have a boat. It's moving. The wind can take them places. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the earth firm. So there's a highway. They'll go, oh, this highway's been here for a hundred years or more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread the earth and kept it firm for the people. And if you see other places where they don't have that blessing, such as the leaning tower of Pisa, Pisa, the Lean Tower of Pisa, and actually I've seen places in Egypt that were like this, where the whole ground they had built, like a whole community on ground that wasn't firm. And so all the apartments were tilting. And people, they were too poor to go other places, they would actually live in these places. So they would walk in on an angle, they'd have to tie up their beds and their, and their um, desks and so on, and they would live there. And this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the earth is spread forth for us. The Arab people were desert travelers and they were very much in tune with their surroundings and with nature. And if you look at all of this, if a person goes out for their journey in the desert, it's as if they're reciting these four verses to them. They're looking at their camel which they're riding on and how it stores its water. And they couldn't ride on horses for example because the horses would run out of water and they wouldn't be able to make the long journeys in the desert. So they have the camel, and then they look up, وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ And to the heavens, how it was raised. And then as they are going on their journey, they look left and right. وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ نُصِبَتْ And the mountains, how they were set firm. وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ And they look down to the earth that they're walking on. وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَيْفَ سُطِحَتْ And to the earth, how it was spread forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Afala, won't they look at this? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fadakir. So remind them. I actually want to read a hadith here, inshaAllah. This hadith is um, narrated by Imam Muslim, in which a man, one of the Bedouins, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the people, the companions, they wouldn't ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam detailed questions. But when people would come from the, from the Bedou, from outside, they would ask these detailed questions because they didn't know the etiquette. And so they would ask questions to the Prophet ﷺ and the companions would sit there and listen to the Prophet ﷺ answer. So a Bedouin came to him, he said, فَقَالِ يَا مُحَمَّدْ إِنَّهُ أَتَانَ رَسُولُكَ He said that indeed one of your um, messengers came to us and he claimed that you claimed that Allah sent you as a Prophet. فَقَالَ لَهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ صَدَقْ He said that person told the truth. Now listen to what the, the Bedouin saying said, قَالَ فَمَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاءِ He said, who created the heavens? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah. He said, فَمَنْ خَلَقَ الْأَرْضِ Who created the earth? فَقَالَ Allah. He said, قَالَ فَمَنْ نَصَبَ هَذِهِ الْجِبَالِ وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا مَا جَعَلَ That who made these mountains firm and, and put in them what he put, 
the water and so on. Qala Allah. And so then the Bedouin replied, he said, فَبِالَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَنَصُبَ هَذِهِ الْجِبَالِ اللَّهُ أَرْسَلَكَ He's saying, then I ask you in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and created the earth and set firm these mountains, did Allah send you as a messenger? And so it's actually a testification in, in a question. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Nah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, sent me. And so these, this is just giving you an example of how they understood that these were the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذَكِّرَ So remind them. And like we said, it doesn't say that, um, or the word فَذَكِّرَ, the reminding, happens when someone already has previous knowledge. This is the fifth verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places an innate nature in the person to recognize their Lord. And when a person tells them about Islam, they're reminding them of that nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in them. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ That indeed, you're nothing more than a reminder, or you're only one who reminds. لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ مُسَيْتِرْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, مُسَيْتِرْ is like a dictator, and one who compulses people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you're not a dictator to force people to become Muslim. And a lot of people, like you said, one of the da'wah techniques, people think that, oh, I'm not going to give da'wah to them because they won't accept. But in reality, it's not our duty to make them accept the, the message. The message, our duty is to make sure that they've received the message. That they've received it. And that we market it and teach the people about Islam and whether they accept or reject, that's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى Except those who turn away, وَكَفَرْ And disbelieve. And also the word kafara also has the, the meaning of being ungrateful. وَكَفَرْ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهِ الْعَذَابِ الْأَكْبَرِ And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them. الْعَذَابِ The punishment. الْأَكْبَرِ The greatest punishment. And so any punishment that they suffered in the dunya, whether it's the toil or hardships or any like physical punishment, that is al-adab al-asra. That's the lower punishment. And the punishment of the hellfire is unlike anything that they've ever felt before. Al-adab al-akbar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. And so the question comes, illa man tawalla wa kafa. The word illa is istithna, meaning that um, if a person says, all the, you know, fourth grade boys went out for recess except Hamza. That's called, like, the exception in Arabic, it's called istithna. In this verse, a person may think that this is istithna, but it's not. It's called uh, istitna, meaning like almost as if a new sentence has beginning. So instead of uh, translating it as save the ones, as if it's a, an exception to the rule, I think it would be better translated as as for the one. As for the one who turns away and disbelieves, فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهِ الْعَذَابِ الْأَكْبَرِ Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ wasn't a dictator upon them, but at the same time they weren't going to get away with their disbelief. That person who's turning away, it's not upon the Prophet ﷺ like, to punish them and force them to become Muslim, but it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will take them to account for that. مَنْ تَوَلَّى وَكَفَرْ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ اللَّهُ الْعَذَابِ الْأَكْبَرِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ إِلَيْنَا إِيَابَهُمْ That indeed, unto us is their إِيَابَهُمْ And it comes from the root of أَوْب If you know the word uh, tawba, everybody knows tawba, right? It comes from that uh, root of, like, to come back. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِيَابَهُمْ Their return is to us. So they'll be doing tawba, right? But it's not coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. They're coming back in the hereafter where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take them to account for their actions. Iyabahum, thumma inna alayna, thumma after that, verily upon us, alayna hisabahum. That you don't take them to account, but upon us, upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to reckon them for their actions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take them to account. And like we said, the background of these surahs, that there were people being tortured, and the Muslims were suffering a lot at this time, and the slavery that was happening. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almost reassuring the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and saying that they'll be coming back to Allah Azza wa Jal and He will take them to reckon for the path they chose. Allah Ta'ala A'lam. Mm-hmm.